let's talk about some important details with regards to this bacteria and how it causes infection. So Neisseria gonorrhea is a gram-negative diplococcus. Gram-negative means that when we do a gram staining, the bacteria will stain pink because of a thinner peptidoglycan cell wall. And it's a diplococcus because it is two cocci together. Now, Neisseria gonorrhea is an obligate intracellular pathogen. Obligate means that it has to do this particular mode of living. And it's intracellular, meaning that it is inside cells. So it's a intracellular pathogen or parasite. So meaning that it lives inside our cells and it has to live in this way in order to replicate and survive. Now, this bacteria only infects humans in nature. And there are multiple strains of Neisseria gonorrhea. We're not going to get into too much detail here, but some of these include serum sensitive strains and serum resistant strains. So this terminology has to do with the strain's ability to evade the complement cascade. So if it is a serum sensitive strain, it means that it is sensitive to the complement cascade. So humans can generally deal with these strains better. So their immune system can deal with it better. And serum resistant strains are able to evade this mechanism. They're more resistant to the host immune system. Now, when an individual is exposed to these Neisseria gonorrhea organisms, if the organisms come into contact with that person's mucous membranes, this can lead to an infection. So some of the mucous membranes that can be invaded by this organism include the lower urogenital tract. This is actually the most common mucous membrane that's affected. It can also infect the pharynx, so this is the throat. It can also infect the anus and rectum and also the conjunctiva of the eyes. So when you get exposed to these bacteria, either through sexual contact or through vertical transmission, the bacteria is going to try to adhere to your cells. And what they do is they actually use what are called pili. And pili are these little hair-like strands that come off of the organism. They can actually use these pili to adhere to epithelial cells. So they can adhere to these cells and they can use these pili to move around from cell to cell. And the particular epithelial cells that are going to most commonly be affected are the cuboidal and columnar epithelial cells. And then when they use these pili to attach to epithelial cells, they also have what are called opacity-associated proteins or OPA proteins on their cell surface. And they use these to also adhere and use them to enter or invade into those epithelial cells. And Depending on the host cell that they're entering into, if it's an epithelial cell in the cervix, for instance, they can use the host cell complement receptors type 3 or CR3 as a potential gateway into that host cell. So once they get inside an epithelial cell, they can start multiplying in that cell. What will then happen is the host immune system will bring in immune cells into that cell, and eventually there can be purulence, so pus, there can be slothing off of these cells, so there can be discharge. So more specifically, when we look at males and females who are infected by this organism, males are going to lead to a urethritis. Urethritis is an inflammation of the urethra. So the urethra is here. And in some cases, the organisms can invade into the epididymis and into the testis. And then in females, these organisms can enter into the cervix and they can cause an inflammation of the cervix known as cervicitis. So they can get into the cervix, especially on the inner side of the cervix, so endocervicitis. And in some cases, they can spread up even further into the female reproductive system. And in this case, this would be considered retrograde spread. And this occurs in approximately 20% of patients. Now, once these organisms have infected individuals, they can be spread via pre-ejaculatory fluid, semen, or vaginal fluid. And with regards to sperm and semen, the Neisseria gonorrhea uses something called lipoligosaccharide or LOS to attach to sperm for transmission purposes. So they can attach to the sperm in the ejaculate and that can help with their transmission to other patients. Now the risk for getting gonorrhea is going to depend on who is the one spreading it. So in males, if it's male to female transmission, the male to female transmission rate is 50 to 70 percent per contact. Whereas with female to male transmission rate, it's only 20% per contact. So some of this has to do with the ability of these organisms to attach to use sperm as a transmission mechanism. Now, there haven't been other transmission rates looked at from male to male or female to female. So these are the only numbers we have, but we can see that males can transmit this more readily than females can. And when an individual does get infected by this organism, the incubation period is roughly 1 to 14 days. It may be less than 10 days. 
in most cases. This is the period where patients have the infection, they're infected by this organism, but they don't experience symptoms yet. So this is the time between infection and symptom onset.